Uh, today, we have Heidi Pittler, and she is the author of the novels The Birthdays and The Daylight Marriage. Uh, a former senior editor at uh, Houghton Mifflin Hardcourt, she has been the series editor of the best American short stories since 2007. Her writing has been published in Plowshares, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, The Huffington Post. Um, it occurs to me that I am America, New Stories and Art, Labor Day, True Birth Stories by Today's Best Women Writers, and elsewhere. She currently teaches in the Low Residency MFA program at Regis University um, in Denver. And of her most recent novel, The Daylight Marriage, which is also right over there, um, the writer Tom Parada says uh, that Pitler merges a shocking crime story with an incisive portrait of a failed marriage. The result is a novel that is fast moving, emotionally complex, and ultimately heartbreaking. And I think that's true. I read this novel in one sitting. Uh, I found it impossible to put down. It's a sharp and it's a voyeuristic book, and it does not flinch as it pulls the reader inside Hannah and Lovell's troubled marriage to show us that where once uh, these characters might have found intimacy and love and understanding with one another, they've now arrived somewhere else. Being married to him, Hannah thinks before she disappears, had become impossible, and this sensation bled into the rest of her life and made her feel as if she had become someone else, someone she hardly knew and didn't like. The novel is structured beautifully. Hannah disappears one morning after a fight, and once she goes missing, the novel's timeline splits. We alternate between scenes of Lovell scrambling with her two children, with their two children, as they wait for word of her from the police, and scenes of Hannah on the day she disappeared. As these two timelines diverge, and the questions of what happened are gradually answered, the formal distance between these two characters and the way that they have been fixed in time becomes almost unbearably sad. Uh, and we see before they do that their separation is complete, final and is not something that can be mended. Uh, so I think this book is a treasure. And after I read it, I apologized to my wife for just about everything, um, just to be <laughs> sure. Um, but Heidi Pittler is an amazing writer, and she's currently at work on her third novel, which uh, she's going to share with us today, right? This is sort of, this is writing in progress, which is also a sort of a special treat. Um, but after her reading, I'm sure she'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have about her work um, or about writing in general. I know that some of you guys are staring down revisions. Um, I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you about that too. So please help me welcome Heidi Pittler. Hi, you guys. Oh, this is good. Okay. Um, so I'm so glad you talked about daylight marriage because I, I, it took me a long time to write and it was dark and sad and when I finished it I thought no more, I need to write something lighter, which is what you get tonight. Um, I really wanted to write something satirical um, and I didn't want to write about marriage or sadness, although there is everything I write becomes sad. Um, so this is a book that is a sort of satire about gender and class. It's called Impersonation, and it's a novel. Um, this is a draft. It's with my editor right now, so if everyone could just cross your fingers that she's okay with this draft, that would be great. Um, what else can I tell you about this? It, I started it five years ago um, before I knew that um, the person who's our president was even running. Um, so it has been bizarre to write it because it is a... It, well, this part does not have much to do with politics, but just keep in mind this this is set before the Me Too movement and before Trump. So um, hopefully it still works. Um, it's set in 2016, but I'll, I'll read you that anyway. So um, it starts out this way. All the same, it irritated Andrew that Nancy should be a woman and Nancy that Andrew should be a man. And they tied their shoes very neatly and drew the bows rather tight. Virginia Woolf to the Lighthouse. Part 1, 2016. My almost four-year-old son was overdue for a big boy bed. Each morning, Cass easily surmounted the cage walls of his old wooden crib. I myself was ready for a motor vehicle with a muffler and a passenger door, rather than a buckling blue tarp held in place with electrical tape. 
I was also ready for decent health insurance as well as the ability to pay a full month's rent and utilities. Every day held the possibility of doom. My agent, Colin, had not found me a ghostwriting job in almost two years. I had my side work landscaping and substitute teaching, but as a single mom living in the Berkshires, it had, it had become tough to cover costs. Colin blamed the Great Recession for this dry spell. I secretly blamed his failed attempt to start his own agency, followed by his months-long sabbatical in Malaysia and Bali. When Colin's correspondence with me began to thin, I invented reasons to contact him, maybe to simply remind him of my existence. Happy New Year! Can you believe we've been working together for 10 years now? Do you think we'll finally get a female president? Whatever will Betsy McGrath think? My last book was a memoir for a Republican congresswoman who had a depressing voting record when it came to supporting women's health. She made no bones about her visceral dislike of Hillary Clinton. Colin's silence may well have caused my burgeoning, burgeoning marijuana addiction. Pot made my situation seem manageable. CBD oil was the only thing that enabled me to sleep. He did not reply until he had finally found me a memoir to ghostwrite. This was in February of 2016, and my relief was immediate and physical, as if I had been stuffed inside a small crate holding my breath. I may as well have just won a lottery. The money would be multiple times what I had earned for any of my previous clients, a motley assortment of minor celebrities and once public figures. Nick Fells would easily be my most high-profile client. I hardly believed Colin at first. It's true, he said over the phone. He himself would take home 15%. I told you I'd come through. Now go buy yourself a spa weekend. I did not tell him I had more pressing, pressing financial needs than pedicures and facials. After we hung up, I went for my son. Don't worry, Cass. These are happy tears, I explained. We can finally buy you a bed. I held him tightly, as if to press all of my relief into his small body. OK, that hurts. I have to pee, he said. <laughs> we had only just begun potty training. I raced him to the bathroom, and that was that. A couple months later, I drove my beautiful new Toyota Tacoma with a double cab off the grounds of the dealership, Janis Joplin's Get It While You Can blasting from the speakers. Ten years earlier, I had left a straitjacket of a corporate writing job in Manhattan in order to move back to my hometown in the Berkshires and become a freelancer. As a ghostwriter, I worked in my kitchen and made my own hours and rules. If I wanted to, I could wear an old t-shirt and pajama bottoms every day. I had never settled into any mediocre relationships. I had a sweet, beautiful son all to myself. I was living life on my own terms, and at long last, I was reaping the benefits. A woman and a single mom at that could have it all. Almost everyone I knew watched, watched Skinwalker Ranch, Nick Fells' TV series about shapeshifters, UFOs, cattle sacrifice, and a coven of bombshell witches. One of my first questions for him over the phone had been, how did you come up with the idea for this show? <clears throat> I've always been into the supernatural, he said. I inhaled Tolkien as a kid. And I'm fascinated with primitive violence. I mean, what raw force really looks like. Domination and justice between two people, you know? Are you a real warrior if you just push a button or tell someone to drop a bomb? On my show, I just have pure human power. Mano a mano. It was important to me to braid this violence with a lot of sex. Let's be real. What's more objectively beautiful than two bodies doing it? Hello, why do you think all the great artists painted so many nudes? Picasso said that to him, sexuality and art were the same thing. Picasso was one of my muses. He paused, as if to allow me to ask who are the others, but then just continued. Picasso and Tolkien and Bukowski and Kerouac. Oh, and women. Can a whole gender be a muse? Why the hell not, am I right? If you asked me which actress I would do from any time in history, I'd say hell no to anyone current like Dakota Fanning or Kristen Stewart. I mean, before she switched teams. Give me Linda Harrison back when she played Nova in Planet of the Apes. Give me Mia Farrow from Rosemary's Baby. He cleared his throat. So in my earliest visions of ranch, ancient Rome met this kind of futuristic Wild West, it would be man against woman, against animal, against the occult, and a hot pandemonium. I wanted to get at that line that sits right between sex and violence, you know, love and hate. I could see it all in my mind before I met with the suits at Amazon. The rest, as they say, is history. No one could claim that Nick suffered from a dearth of audacity or libido or good luck. 
He'd gotten into TV soon after his first-person shooter game franchise, Honor Code, had exploded onto the marketplace, outselling even some Grand Theft Auto games. I tried playing it with a friend's son on, on his PlayStation, but could not manage to pass level one. Within seconds, my arms were ripped off and my head exploded like a ripe melon against my opponent's fortress wall. A female soldier in a black bikini appeared and stomped all over my brain matter. How are you able to win this thing, I asked Connor, who was 11. Maybe you just need to practice more or be like younger, he said. <laughs> By the time Nick Fells was 27, he had won three video game awards, three Emmys, two Hugos, and had bought himself a modern five bedroom in Malibu with an infinity pool and views that stretched from the Santa Barbara Islands to Point Doom. How many people, he said, could claim to have done any of these things before the age of 30? On the page, he came across as even more brash than he had over the phone. I tried to tone him down and make him more likable wherever I could. I gave him a heightened appreciation of his vast fortune. I played up his relationship with his mother and dialed down his many public publicized escapades with Brazilian models. At heart, Nick was not a bad guy. He donated big money to the NAACP and Boys Town, a charity for at-risk kids, as well as Planned Parenthood. He was curious about me and how I had gotten into ghostwriting and about Cass and what it was like to be the white parent of a biracial kid. Nick and I had a long conversation about the need for more diverse characters in children's programming. Most of my previous clients treated me more like a therapist, a husk of a person whom, with whom they could trust to be gentle with their truths. After I sent Nick a few chapters to make sure I was on the right track, he texted me for the first time. He wrote, Dude, you made me sound like a twinkle bitch. Can I ask what you mean by twinkle bitch? I replied, a little sick inside. A douche nozzle, an asshat. Just keeping it real, Allie, because we're friends, right? The part about my fans was good, but you wouldn't use the words twinkle bitch, just like I would never say, my life has been a series of precious gifts. Or as I look out over the ocean, a glass of wine in my hand, I told you I'm a whiskey guy. Can you add a huge amount of sack? Any response that is less than stellar about your writing can, in the moment, be diminishing. But after the sting of his blunt criticism passed, I considered his newly casual tone. Apparently he, V. Nick Fells, had decided that we were now friends and should begin texting each other. Tons of sack coming right up, I wrote. As a newly solvent 43-year-old mom who secret secretly preferred British TV mysteries to Skinwalker Ranch, weed to whiskey, Bob Dylan to Kanye, books to video games, and privacy to ostentation, I did not think Nick Vells and I had much in common. But ghostwriting is a form of acting, method acting really, as well as improvisation. You must become your subject. Sitting at my kitchen table, I decided that I just had to stop thinking like a female. No one was asking for grace or modesty here. I downed a mug of black coffee and returned to the so-called drawing board. And this is her writing. I am living the life I have always wanted. I've been called a wonderkind and a rating mach ratings machine. My shows can be seen in Japan, Australia, on airplanes, at an American military, military bases in Iraq. I've got a candy red Ferraro Enzo, a first edition of Dracula, and Axel, my reticulated python, has his own climate-controlled bedroom with a killer view of the, of the Pacific. At first, I hesitated every few sentences, shuddering. I had to remind myself to continue on in this manner, that bravado was the point. Other clients had shackled me with their fears of exposing the slightest unflattering truths. Most panicked about coming across as too cocky, too lucky, slutty, opinionated. Invisible electric fences were everywhere. I had written mostly for women. The Connecticut Congresswoman's memoir had to have been my most frustrating, limiting book. Sorry, Connecticut. <laughs> I had to downplay her considerable wealth, avoid any mention of her first two marriages, cut a long section on her critical thoughts of a sex trafficking prevention bill, I might as well have been writing marketing copy for the state of Connecticut itself. But with time and practice, SAC came to be liberating, even kind of fun. Very little of Nick's life was off limits to me. The work could seem more like transcription than anything else. Once I understood what he wanted, after I got the green light from him on a revised first chapter and let go of any remaining self-consciousness, we worked well together. He was enthusiastic and forthcoming and consistent, and before long I could even predict some of his answers to my questions. 
He liked to pontificate and philosophize with me about human nature. He tended to overuse the words primitive and transformative. We had long conversations about, long phone conversations about Abraham Lincoln, the creative process, relationships, skin care, and the versatility of avocados. He liked my chapters two through five so much that he sent me a hot pink Gucci handbag and cast a samurai, samurai sword. And although I was more of an old navy kind of person and the sword nearly decapitated my son, I was touched. One day, Nick invited me to meet him for coffee before an upcoming gaming conference in Albany, about an hour away from our house. I did not often get to meet my clients, and I automatically texted, what time and where? Only after I pressed send did a soupy ambivalence form within me. I would get to meet him in person, but he would also get to meet me. I am not proud to say that I had been coy with Nick about my age. My instinct told me that he would respond better if he thought I was closer to his age and possibly hot. When he had asked to Skype, I told him that my computer's microphone wasn't working. If he had Googled me, he would have found nothing. I had kept the lowest possible profile over the years. It wasn't that I was embarrassed of what I looked like. I had zero desire to turn on Nick Fells. But to be perfectly honest, I did not want to repel him either. A, a droplet of innocent flirtation could be useful in working relationships. It could help equalize the standing between a woman and a man. I had learned this 11 long years ago at my job writing marketing copy for an equity firm in New York. A college friend had passed along her entry level job to me once she learned she was pregnant. I was never harassed there in the legal sense, but what female had not taken part in harmless innuendo or witnessed a chummier, better looking female colleague get moved up to management? In hindsight, I suppose that I allied with my male colleagues, although this was never a conscious decision. They were looser and more entertaining than the few women in the office, a couple of mid-level workaholic lifers, and one brilliant, if aloof, if aloof, junior analyst. I began to joke around with the guys, and one evening took part, and almost, took part in and almost won an after-work drinking contest with them at a nearby pub. The following week, they invited me to lunch at a Tony American Bistro, where I was the only female at the table. Frankly, I was thrilled to be admitted to their private club as they discussed classic Bruce Springsteen set lists, the breasts of certain A-list actresses, Enron, the access of evil, and the New York Knicks, I worked on my turkey club sandwich and sweet potato fries. You are the first girl I've ever seen order anything but salad for lunch, one said approvingly. Over time, my jokes became as dirty as theirs, if not more so. On some level, being one of the guys must have felt like safe harbor. When they began to flirt openly with me, I brushed them off, but always gently and with ambiguity. They, nickna they nicknamed me Little Tiger because of my preference for a shot of slow gin with the same name. <clears throat> Within a month, I was offered a raise and moved from my cubicle to a small office and even got to handle correspondence and some research for one of the marketing directors. At dawn on the Tuesday that I would drive to Albany, I carried my sleeping son across our front yard, sidestepping a crushed Dunkin' Donuts bag. The ranch house that I had been renting for six years was situated on a cut-through that led to the Mass Pike, the cars and trucks audible from inside at all times. People often use my balding front yard as a dumping ground. No matter how many times I had aerated, seeded, watered, and fertilized my landlord's yard, no more than a couple dozen strands of grass grew hardly an endorsement for my part-time landscaping work. I tripped over some tree roots and my neighbor's dog broke into a bark and I whispered to Cass, please don't wake up, please don't wake up, because if he did, he would detonate. He was no good with separation. In a nightgown and no upper dentures, my neighbor and sitter, Bertie, met me at her screen door. I've got him, she said as she reached for Cass, but she was too frail to carry him. So I gestured for her to hold the door as I went inside and set him on her butterscotch colored couch. I hated to leave my son while he slept. He had no father who might watch him today. His Tigger sweatshirt was too small. Bertie's house smelled of incontinence and there was a long gash in her screen door, not that my house was in much better repair. My front steps were crumbling, an accident waiting to happen, and the roof leaked almost daily. My landlord was frustratingly slow to repair such things. Thanks to Nick's book, though, I had started looking for a much nicer place. 
I kissed my forefinger and grazed it past Cass's cheek. Thanks, Bertie. You're a lifesaver, I told her, and confirmed that I would pick up my son late that night. Back home, I contained my unruly hair within the neatest bun I could manage and changed into the professional ensemble that my good friend Maggie, Connor's mom, had helped me find the other day at Ann Taylor. When I suggested that we find an edgier store at the mall, something with more personality like Forever 21 or Zara, she said, I think you know this person is really, wait, I know you think this person is really cool and everything, but you might not want to try too hard to look hip and relevant, you know? Relevant, I thought, that gentle euphemism for young. She added that the clothes at Ann Taylor were much better made, and she was not mistaken. The first pair of gray pants that I tried on had lining that moved like cream against my skin. The buttonhole was thick and reinforced, and the zipper slid right up. I used to wear clothing like this back in New York. I should have kept those outfits instead of donating them to Goodwill when I started working at home. At the time, I had been so glad to part with those stiff, constricting business suits and toe-pinching heels, those trappings of a person who had come to seem less and less like me. <coughs> it took me about an hour to reach Albany, and I found Nick in a, private in a private booth toward the back of Wellington's, a swank restaurant with the feel of a cigar bar in the hotel where he was staying. A notably fit, attractive black guy about Nick's age sat next to him, and both tapped at their iPhones. Nick appeared younger in person, his face a soft moon. Blonde stubble dotted his chin. A Lakers cap on his head, he looked up at me with glinty blue eyes and said, You're Allie? I nodded. Hi, Nick. <clears throat> Here was a guy who worked with some of the most beautiful people on our planet. I imagined him taking in the vertical lines between my eyebrows, that dry skin by my nostrils. Screw it, I thought, and held my head high. Sit, sit, he said. The other guy kept his eyes on his phone, but coughed into one fist. Thanks, I said, and lowered myself into a weird metal bowl of a chair across from them. He squinted over at me. Dude, you are way hotter than I thought you'd be. Oh, thanks, I said. I may have chuckled and picked at my hands. His friend looked up, but returned to his phone without expression. <laughs> well, I'm a lot older than you, I blurted. Older means bolder, right, he said. So they say... I tried to think of something else that rhymed with older, but came up empty. <laughs> I reminded myself that I need not seduce this person, that my only need was to keep this job, and there was no danger of losing it. You have a good flight? What time did you get in? I asked. Like an hour ago, I slept through most of it. He kept his eyes on me. It's so weird. I pictured you as kind of a frump, like with a mullet. Maybe it was just that first time I read your stuff, you know, you sounded a little lame. I guess first impressions stick. He shook his head. Well, I said, you're not so frumpy yourself. Maybe we should write a book together, I heard myself joke. Our banter halted when a statuesque 20-something with a red bob and jade green eyes appeared at the table to take my order. Just a cup of coffee, please, I said. You're Shannon, Nick said, his eyes on the name tag pinned just north of her buoyant right breast. His friend looked up at her and slid his phone into his back pocket. Shannon, can you fill me up, Nick said. He raised his coffee mug to his mouth and gave the rim an almost imperceptible lick. I think I can do that. She flashed a smile, her face pink, and she turned to take someone else's order. The friend muttered something that, taste, that, that sounded like tasty. Nick looked back at me. <laughs> so, Allie, I read those chapters you sent. It was wild. It's like I got cloned, and my clone wrote this incredible book about me. It turned me on how much you got into my head. Honestly, I'm getting turned on right now just thinking about it. Great, I said. <laughs> what a relief to no longer be thought of as a twinkle bitch. He made a few minor suggestions. He wanted me to cut the bit about his bully neighbor when he was a kid, as well as his childhood pet rabbit, Buttercup. He did not think I needed to use the name of the bougie town outside Chicago where he had grown up. No one wants to hear about all that boring shit. I took notes on my phone as he spoke. We got to talking about the next season of Skinwalker Ranch, his python, his sister's new twins. The day before, I had started writing a scene between him and his mother. She had struggled a lot since her divorce, and in the scene, Nick was about to tell her that he had just bought her a condo in, in Malibu. How's your mom's lupus, I asked. She had a flare-up last week and sacked out on my couch for a couple days, he said. Poor thing's face looked like a plate of charcuterie. I hired my massage therapist for her, and she was in heaven. Maurice does all the older ladies on set. He's my birth birthday gift to them. Nick asked me about Cass's separation anxiety and whether I had yet tried avocado toast. His friend said, Fally, I've got a split. I'll be at the booth with Jim and Jim. 
They fist pumped and a moment later, Nick and I were alone. He explained that Curtis and the two gyms were here to promote Honor Code Execution Time, the sixth installment in the series. I do so little for my game these days, Nick said, with the regret of a divorced father toward his child. Life gets mad busy. Hey, I brought you something. He reached into a leather folder on the table. I got Fufu Mohammed's autograph for Cass. She does the voice of Doc McStuffins. He handed me a slip of paper on which she had written, Dear Cass, don't forget to stretch and flex. Your friend, Doc. Oh my God, I said. He said, it's no big thing. My son ingested easily three episodes of Doc McStuffins every day. He sang the theme song constantly. Cass saw few, so few characters on TV who looked anything like him, although I suspected the more immediate appeal had to do with his passion for stuffed animals. Nick, he will die. You have no idea, I said. Nick smiled. This is fucking amazing, I said. I think I'm turned on right now. You sound just like me. It's dope. How do you do that, he asked. I said, I'm kind of a sponge, I guess. A month later, I stood watching Cass ride his new pedal bike around an elementary school parking lot, now vacant for the summer. We had just come from visiting a two-bedroom, two-bath, fully renovated bungalow in Stockbridge. It had a screened-in front porch, an attic that could be used as a playroom or an office, and was located a block away from Beartown State Forest. Lilac bushes formed a small hedge and gave the house privacy from the neighbor on one side, and two enormous dogwoods and a crabapple tree shaded the front lawn, a carpet of dense, lush grass. I'm in love, I swooned to the realtor. She said she would go get started on the lease. You got this, use the brakes if you need them, Kurt called out to Cass and took my hand. Kurt and I had been together-ish for about four months. He had his faults, ambition and money were not currently his things, but he was great with Cass, a kid who liked to draw and listen to music rather than roughhouse and play catch. Kurt was also easy on the eyes and gifted in bed. Not so fast, I hollered, just as Cass tipped over onto a bike rack. We rushed to help him. My cell phone rang. It was my agent's number, so I answered and Kurt gestured for me to take the call that he would take care of Cass. I headed toward the basketball court for some privacy. You might want to sit down, Colin told me in a funny voice. I've got some news. Okay, I said. I glanced around, but there was nowhere to sit. Nick Fells is in a bit of trouble, he said. Kayla Hoken was a lead on Skinwalker Ranch, but I didn't recognize the other two names. There were multiple charges of sexual assault, as well as three other currently anonymous allegations of attempted assault. Wait, rape, I said. My heartbeat zoomed. Jesus Christ. Colin went on to tell me that Nick's memoir had been canceled, production on Skinwalker Ranch halted, and that a press conference with the prosecuting attorneys was taking place as we spoke. I grew disoriented. I wondered if the police had, in fact, had the right person, if someone had made an enormous mistake. I had been writing for Nick, as Nick, for nearly six months now, and inside my chest, alongside my confusion, was a fast-wilting flower of sympathy or empathy or something. You do not want to see the cover of the New York Post tomorrow, Colin said. I'll try to avoid it, I managed. An image came to me of Kayla, who played Mai, the eldest daughter of Ahiga, one of two shapeshifters. A stunning girl with spirals of black hair and yellow-green eyes, Kayla could not have been older than 23. Is Kayla all right, I said slowly. And the others, what about them? I have no clue. I think it all happened like a year or two ago, Colin said. Oh, well, I'm sure they're doing just terrific now, I said. He scoffed. Hey, don't blame the messenger. His less than grave tone chafed at me. Nick Fells was hardly puritanical. What percentage of men in, in show business were? In any business, really. Even 86-year-old tubercular Clyde Elliott, a former astronaut, had interrupted his monologue over the phone, describing his first circumlunar flight to tell me I had a voice like Lauren Bacall's and that he'd wager I had her figure, too. I'd like to see it sometime, your figure, he had said, and I had dumbly replied, maybe, you never know, and changed the subject. <laughs> men pushed limits, certainly men in show business, but rape multiple times? Everything inside me shifted and dropped. Colin went on, you'll get paid for what you already did, Al. He usually split my payment into thirds. At that point, I had only received one third of the total fee. My thoughts spun out. I didn't finish writing it yet, but I'm close. Oh, I thought you'd done less. I negotiated for half your next payment. Still, that's not bad, right? This was the lead title on Assembly's spring list. 
They're taking a bath on it. Let's be grateful they're paying you at all, right? Assembly can easily absorb this loss, I said. I would have to say goodbye to our charming Stockbridge bungalow. The week before, I had enrolled Cass in a preschool that would start soon and had finally gotten us a decent health insurance plan. There was the truck I had bought and paid for outright, and I had even booked Cass and me a five-day trip to Disney World, assuming that these expenses would be easily covered by the payment headed my way. We were scheduled to fly to Orlando in just a few days. God, I cannot believe we're having this conversation, I finally said. Although given everything I had heard and known and seen of Nick Fells, was it really all that unfathomable? Yeah, Colin said. Well, chin up. Hey, I just got a line on a new book for you. It's early stages. I can't tell you anything else right now, but believe me, if it comes through, it'll make you feel way better about this whole mess. And I'm not just talking about money. I can't even think about writing another book right now, I said. Well, get over it, he said, half joking. I said, your compassion is touching, really. Both your compassion for me and for Kayla and the others. Allie, he said, I never even met Nick or any of those other, any of those women. I couldn't identify Kayla Hogan if she were standing next to me right now. You think maybe you're projecting your anger at Nick onto me? I said, do you think that maybe because you're male and have never had to worry about being assaulted or raped or about needing to provide for a child, that maybe since you have that luxury and have no idea what it's like to go for two eternal years without health insurance or enough, I, he interrupted, I should let you go digest this news. Yeah, I said. I cursed myself for railing against the one person who brought in the majority of my income. I gave him a half-hearted apology and asked him to keep me posted about that next job. After we said goodbye, I stuffed my phone in my back pocket and stood for a moment. I remembered with a shudder a scene from Skinwalker Ranch when Kayla, in the form of a human, had been made to bear almost everything for that orgy with the witches and the man-wolves at the top of a mesa. The eye of the camera inched up Kayla's body, slowing at the dip of her waist and upward curve of her breast. It slid up her neck to her young face, pinched in a combination of fear and ecstasy as a man-wolf and a young raven-haired witch, dressed in a see-through caftan, had their way with her. The eye veered to her hand, her fingers clenching the hand of her mother, a higa, and then to the small of the witch's back, the soft flat of the woman's stomach, and back to Kayla, or Mai, and a higa as they both gradually shape-shifted into snarling foxes. I thought of all that I myself had written for Nick about the beauty of the female nude body, about his near worship of Picasso and Bukowski and Planet of the Apes, the inherent relationship between sex and violence, all that garbage he'd had me write about his net worth and model girlfriends and Axel, his spoiled snake all that garbage that I had willingly written. Everything okay? Kurt asked as I approached him. You look weird. Yeah, I said. Colin's excessively cautious non-disclosure agreements typically held in perpetuity and even after a client's death. He had been burned more than once by indiscreet ghostwriters. I said, I just lost a really lucrative job. Around Cass went, making vroom vroom noises and squeezing the horn on the handlebars. I would have to tell him that the new house and Disney World were off the table. He had already planned where each of his stuffed animals would live in his new bedroom. We had made a paper chain, each link representing a day before we would fly to Orlando, and only three links remained. It might have been easier to tell him I was putting him up for adoption. Kurt said, you'll figure it out, hon. I don't know, I said. Maybe I could write Kayla a letter and apologize, an idea that made no sense, of course. You want to go to Cafe Lucia for dinner tonight? Kurt asked. We've been going out to eat at least a couple times a week lately. Cass loved the spaghetti there. No way. I need to figure out if I can even afford that new health insurance now. I'm so screwed, I said. It can't be as bad as you think. I'll cook tonight. I'll make homemade pizza or something. Sound good? At the moment, Kurt worked part-time at his friend Pete's hardware store and was trying his hand as a sculptor. A year younger than I, he lived in my basement and paid a small portion of my rent when he could. Sure, I said. Later that night, after I put Cass to bed and Kurt had gone out for a drink with Pete, I smoked a bowl, paced the kitchen, ate three-eighths of a leftover portobello mushroom and chicken pizza, and two ice cream sandwiches, regretted it, checked the price on the container of portobellos, and winced, ate half a bag of pretzels in my son's last flavor ice, saw myself as if from above, and grew disgusted. This new weed was crap. Virgil, my dealer, and the gym teacher at the local high school had talked me into it. If anything, the weed had given my nerves a boost. 
I need you to give up carbs, get a real job, and stop freelancing. Exercise, give up pot, take cast to a museum or two, force them to eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables myself, read more. I considered how long it had been since I'd read a great book, something that made me feel substantial. Likely the amount of time that my son had been in my life. I found an old favorite that I, that I kept from an, a woman's studies course at Dartmouth. Virginia Woolf was appropriate for the occasion. Yes, of course, if it's fine tomorrow, said Mrs. Ramsey, but you'll have to be up with the lark, she added. My thoughts veered off to Nick Fells and Kayla Hogan and back to the scene atop the mesa, the bikini-clad soldier in honor code, the waitress in Albany, and then to Cinderella Castle, to the screened-in front porch of that beautiful Stockbridge bungalow. I vowed to set fire to that Gucci bag. Better yet, I would donate the bag and the sword to some charity that helped women, domestic violence victims, maybe. And that Doc McStuffins autographed? Mm. I'd had it framed for Cass and had clearly amplified my value in his eyes. Maybe I would just let that one be. Thank you. So, any questions? Yeah, if you guys have any questions, we have a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I read your book. Thank you. Like marriage. Thank you. And I thought it was a worthwhile book reading because you. it you went into a situation that a lot of authors don't cover, and it's probably one that occurs in a diff different ways in different families. Mm -hmm. And you showed one possible way in which it could play out, and I thought that was educational to me. But I do have one question. Why did you pick the title Daylight Marriage? For that we book? were just talking about that earlier. Um, well, so that book easily went through oh, dozens of titles. Um, and the, uh, let's see, it had an earlier, it was, I, I revised that a lot. So earlier titles reflect, reflected kind of a different version of that book. Then we landed on a title called We All Fall Down, which seemed, you know, to make sense. And then we learned soon after that another book was coming out with that title. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And um, I came up with the daylight marriage because I thought there's a lot of light imagery in the book. And there's something about that book that is ev everyone's being exposed. The truth is being exposed. Um, there was just a lot of uh, and the idea of exposure and what a marriage is really like versus what it's like in the dark. So I liked that and I liked that it wasn't, it didn't exactly reflect the book. I liked that, it, to me, it felt a little mysterious, which I think I thought was right for this book. Sure. And this, this book right here, clearly very different. <laughs> Any other questions, concerns? I mean, I, I, yeah. It is clearly different. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to sort of talk about switching gears, I guess. It not only is it, because the day that marriage is very, um, it's not, I mean, it's dark and, pro and propulsive. It's not depressing or anything like that. But this is clearly really funny. And so with the day that marriage is also third person. And this, this is, is first, first person, person. right. So it's first time you've written sort of a novel in first person. So what, what's that experience been like for you? Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really important with each project, with each thing that you write to do, to set yourself a new challenge. And, um, you know, this book was weighty. And, and this one is too, in a lot of ways. I mean, it deals with something, but I just felt like I wanted um, to try something new. I want, so for my last two books, there are multiple points of view. They have, Daylight Marriage has two, The Birthdays has four. And I said to myself, I want to just tell one story from one person, first person, which feels really constrictive to me. Um, and so her, Allie is her name, her voice just kind of came out of me. Um, and I also wanted to write about someone who was kind of a worker bee, an invisible worker bee, because there are a lot of them in publishing. The people who don't really get credit, but the people who do all the work. And what that's like to be behind the scenes. Um, I talked to a lot of ghostwriters, so fascinating. Um, what they do, and, and they're just invisible. They have no presence in the world, you know, a lot of them. Some of them do. But there is a funny tension between um, the ghostwriter and the subject. This book, just to tell you a little bit about where it goes, the main part of the book is that she's writing for a very prominent fem feminist who is going to run for office. So she's trying to make her more appealing. 
um, and they kind of said about she she kind of has to adopt parts of Allie's life to be more believable on the campaign trail. So it's you know what parts of your life are your own and what are others and um, what does work mean? What what amount of yourself is okay to give up and what is not? Um, so it just felt like really different issues at hand to me, and it was it was just fun. It's fun to. Um, you know, I, I, I think when I started writing this, my head had, it was just in a really different place. My kids were a little older. I just wanted to have a little more fun with it and spoof people. And um, so this is kind of what came out. Any other questions? This is the second time I've read from this. So, so thank you for putting up with me. It's probably not perfect, but go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about uh, using humor to yeah. like write about very big world questions. Yes. Um, how do you do that? Like, how do you maintain the seriousness of the subject, right. but also maintain the integrity of? It is so hard, and I'm still not sure I've done it right. I every once in a while I think, oh, you cannot joke about rape, and I I try not to. Um, you, I think you have to. I always think if you know if you if you give something its attention. I mean, I don't think you can joke about pain, you know, or or you can probably, but I I don't seem to do it well. It was tough, and this, you know, in an earlier draft, my editor seems to shove me right into the hot belly of the beast every time. And this is a new this guy. Nick is a new character in the book, so she was writing about sexism without really writing about being touched by it, and, and she had to, and I thought, well, I don't want to have her, you know, initially she had been assaulted, and I felt like that's a really straight line between that and feminism. I wanted it to be a little less direct, um, and I do, you know, part of me thought when the whole um, Harvey Weinstein thing came out, I thought, what about all these people professionally that worked with him that then just, you know, fell down, and what is that like, and, you know, so I don't have the answer, but I do know that I just felt like I wanted something that was entertaining. We are in such a dark time right now. Everything we're reading feels airless to me. And I felt like if there's a way to write satire about feminism, I want to try to do it. That said, remember, so I started this five years ago before any of this broke. And it just felt like I was being followed by like a horrible avalanche. Like I'd write something. I'm like, why did you come true? What is that? <laughs> Like, Me Too wasn't there, none of this. And everything I wrote, I was like, oh my god, Hillary, what, what is going on? It, was, it still feels a little bit like I'm going to just get like flattened one day. You know, who knows what's going to happen if this is st still relevant. So I just I gave it an end date, 2017, which now feels like 20 years ago. And it just is that moment, and it is what it is. But it's tricky, but I think it's important to try. That's all I would say. Any other questions? Thank you guys so much for coming. This was really fun. Thanks for having me.